Welcome to Meeple Chat. Today we're going to learn how to play Time of Legends Joan of Arc by Mythic Games. My name is David Nisikowski and I'll be hosting this how to play video. A second part will be a playthrough video of the introductory scenario. First, I would like to take this time to thank the board game geek user Drakenblade for sponsoring this video. The how to play video will be presented in the following sequence. First, an overview and goal of the introductory scenario, along with its components and setup, and then start player in turn order, along with player actions, scoring, ending the introductory scenario, and then additional rules that are not needed for the introductory scenario will be covered. You will need components from the Joan of Arc core set and the reliquary box. Joan of Arc is a hybrid historical fantasy game set during the Hundred Years' War, approximately 1337 to 1453 Common Era. And the reason why it's a fantasy game is that in some scenarios, you will have the opportunity to fight dragons, demons, or werewolves. Now, it plays two to four players. Playing time is approximately 45 to 90 minutes, but that does not include setup time. Ages 14 and up, and according to Board Game Geek, the mechanics are action point allowance system, area movement, dice rolling, modular board, and variable player powers. The victory conditions as shown here for the introductory scenario can be found on page 4 in the scenario booklet. In this historical scenario, it is the French versus the English. The French win if Bertrand gets to the village of Renace to save the civilians who are being starved out by the sieging English. The English win if all the civilians are starved or if Bertrand is destroyed by round five. If neither side achieves victory conditions by round five, then it is a draw. The components for the introductory scenario is shown here. They will also be used for the console phase, the first phase of the game. Here you have the battle board with the round cards, the war council cards. Each player will have a player board, and here are the order cubes. Now the introductory scenario, as in other scenarios, may require you to stack order cards in a particular order. They will be revealed, one of which will be revealed each round of the game. In addition, for the introductory scenario, it requires you to stack war council cards in a particular order two of which will only be revealed each round of the game. Normally, three will be revealed. These components will be used for the council phase. The following components will be used for the order phase, where players will take actions with their troops. So here are the English troops, the French troops. Each player has legendary cards and legendary tokens and a reroll token. Experience tokens are here wound tokens, the bowmen will get stakes, here are the hex tiles, and the battle dice. Troops and characters are also known as units. Characters and civilians have their own base, where infantry troops, there's usually three to a base, two cavalry to a base, one war machine with two artillerymen, or one or two flying miniatures per base. Here you have the two heroes, to their own base. You have three bowmen to a base, two mounted bowmen on a base, two cavalry to a base, and then here are the civilians on their own. You'll also notice that heroes are on tarot-sized cards and troops are on regular playing-sized cards. Units can also belong to factions, as you can see the icons here in the left-hand corner of the screen. For example, if the English hero were to upgrade, the unit would become part of the Holy Faction. Some civilians, for instance, belong to factions, as you see here. You will also use the following terrain in the introductory scenario, minus the rocks and swamp hex tiles. Page 5 of the scenario booklet shows how to set up the map. So here you have trees and forests, you have fields, plains, hills, rally points, which will be explained later, village hex tiles, building overlays, and stakes can be placed by bowmen during the game. After the game has been set up according to the scenario booklet, we now look at the scenario booklet to determine who the start player is. In this case, 
The English player is a start player and receives a start player token. Now we can begin the game and discuss the game's phase and turn order. You'll see that there's four steps to a round. There's the council phase, the first player's turn, the second player's turn, and the camp phase. During the council phase, the first thing that you'll do is draw the round card. Now, as I already mentioned, the five that are used for the introductory scenario are placed in the order according to the scenario booklet. So each player will get two regular activation uh, cubes. In the place at the top here, you'll see, for instance, that the French player started with one charge order. So the ones that are not used, you can store up to three from one turn to the next, or one round to the next, I should say. So here is where you'll put charge orders, reactivation orders, and interrupt orders. Next, you draw two war council cards, at least for the introductory scenario. In other scenarios, you'll draw three. And remember that this introductory scenario, the cards are programmed. So you know what two are going to come up the first round. Then the second round, it's going to be uh, two that are pointed out in the scenario booklet. But in other games, it will be a random deck. So now each player, starting with the English player who has the start player token, will decide which card he or she wants to use. And because the English player is thinking of upgrading his hero, you will need three experience points to do that. Which, when that happens later on in the round, you can choose either this side or this size of a second level hero. So he's going to take three experience tokens. Now the English player, since the English player already starts with two legendary tokens, which is needed to pay for legendary cards, See, he has the two he needs to use this card during his turn. He's going to decide, I wanted some more options, and will choose two legendary cards randomly from the deck, decide which one to keep, maybe go with this one here, and discard the other. Next, you'll see there's an upkeep. Uh, step in the council phase. So what that means, if this hero was already a level two, let's say both of them were level two, each player would have to spend experience tokens, one experience token, to keep that player at level two. So if the French player did not have the one experience token, then it would revert back to first level. After the council phase, it will be the first player's turn. Now this will be the most complicated part of the game, which will be issuing orders, moving, attacking, uh, using special skills and bonus actions, and dealing with terrain effects. So you'll see that units that includes characters and troops, can move, attack, recruit civilians, or wait. Now wait is basically they don't do anything their turn, which can be forced upon enemy units basically making them miss a turn. Skill actions will be on cards. Uh, character bonus actions uh, will be used by your heroes, to dis uh, which I'll explain as they come up. And then player actions is done by the player. For instance, you can play a legend card that you have uh, spending the tokens to play it, or trigger an intrigue, which I'll go over at the end of this, uh, pl of this how to play, uh, which is not used for the introductory scenario. I'm now going to break down unit actions, beginning with the move action. In order to understand the move action, we need to talk about hexes, areas, and spaces. So a hex with one area can hold eight spaces or eight units. The reason why I say spaces is because some units will be larger and take up more spaces. All the units in the introductory scenario only take up one space. A hex with two areas 
each area can hold six spaces. A hex with three areas, each area can hold four spaces. Now the interesting thing is about buildings is that buildings take up a space, but inside the building it will have a number, in this case a two, and two units can be inside the building. Now one rule to remember is that enemy units cannot be in the same space as another enemy unit. Allied units can move through so, for instance, uh, the mounted bowmen have haste. They can move two spaces, one, two, into this space because this space is not full. If the space was full with six units, then the mounted bowmen could not move through there. And the reason why I point that out is because buildings is the ex exception. You could have enemy units in the building area, uh, in the village area, but then an enemy unit inside the building. So that's one of the few exceptions. The graphic on the right is useful when determining adjacent areas for movement. It is also useful when determining melee attacks and ranged attacks. For example, here you have a French cavalry unit. The English sergeant of arms here cannot attack this cavalry unit because diagonals are not adjacent. Now the bowmen can attack the cavalry unit even though they're adjacent it's still considered a ranged attack. So how do you move a unit? Well you have to issue an activation order and it's the same process for activating a unit to attack as well. So beginning with the start player, in this case it's the English, they take one of their activation cubes, and then they have to decide which area to activate. So they're going to decide to move their mounted bowmen. Now most units only move one space, but the mounted bowmen have a haste skill. And the haste skill allows them to move two areas. Now you can find out there's an, a handy player's aid here with all the skills listed that come. There's two copies that come with the core box. So they're going to move two areas. Now let's say they wanted to attack. The, uh, the English player can take another activation cube and place it in this area. So you can only have one activation cube in an area. Now they could also move again too if they wanted to, but because they have a range, as you can see right here, of two, they can hit units up to two space areas away. So they could activate here and then fire at the cavalry here. And I'll go over how uh, to use the battle dice here in a moment. Now let me go over a couple other cubes for movement. You may remember that the French player had a charge activation. Well, in order to use that, you need to have a unit with the charge skill. So that allows troops with the charge skill. If they're infantry, they can move one space, or if they're cavalry, they can move two spaces and attack. So they can charge right here, but there's nothing to attack. So they probably would want to save that. So let's say the mounted bowmen did move there. They don't even have to move the two spaces. Say, say it was this way. way. The cavalry can move one space, even though they can move up to two, char uh, move and attack. So that's the advantage of having a charge activation cube. Now one thing about the activation cubes, again you have your charge, 
your reactivation, and your interrupt cubes, they can all be used as regular activation cubes. So even if you don't have Calvary anymore and you want to activate a different unit, you could just use the green cube as a regular activation uh, cube. Same with the reactivation and the interrupt cubes. So it's important to remember that you place cubes in areas to activate units. You decide whether or not you want to move the unit or attack with the unit, or if you have the proper skill, move and attack. So now, now let's talk about declaring an attack. It's important to understand the different symbols, though. So many units have melee attack, which you can see with that sword symbol. Some have range attacks. The arching shot allows you to shoot over areas that have forests or hills, for instance, whereas direct shots cannot shoot over areas that are blocking line of sight, so to speak. It's important to remember that when an order cube is placed into an area, that not all the units have to do the same type of activation. Some units can move, some units can attack, some units don't even have to attack the same area, or the units don't even have to move to the same area. However, if a unit or more than one unit attacks an area, all those attacks have to happen in that area at the same time. You can't have a Bowman attack that area first, and then have the sergeant of arms attack it next. All the dice are rolled at the same time into that area that's attacked. For example, the English player activates this area. The hero will move here. The sergeant of arms will attack these cavalry units. The bowman will attack this cavalry unit. Now, it's good that the bowman have the arching ranged attack so that they can shoot over the cavalry units in this space. Now let's go into more detail on taking an attack action. It's important to point out a couple of features on a character or a troop card. You'll see where the E is on the left side of your screen that the type of attack that the unit can do in this case, it's a melee attack. You might see the arching range shot or the direct range shot. And then underneath the type of attack is the type of battle dice and the number of battle dice that the unit will roll. By the way, I did not mention what the G is. You'll see units that have a infantry symbol or a cavalry symbol or a war machine symbol or a flying unit symbol. In the introductory scenario, you're only going to be working with infantry and cavalry units. Most units will also have a defense attribute. You'll see there by the letter F, the helmet symbol, and underneath the helmet symbol, that particular unit will roll a black battle die. When you look at Bertrand, the hero for the French side, he'll have roll one red die on defense, but he also has five health. Now it's important to note the health of units because when a kill result is rolled on a battle die, units with more than one health will take a wound. Most units only have one health point and it's not even shown on the uh, troop card. It won't have a symbol here. So if it doesn't have a red symbol there that shows two or more, then you know that it only has one health point. The other results that you can get on a battle die include the disrupt symbol. So units with one health will be disrupted to the infirmary, whereas characters with two or more health, if they have uh, at least two or more health remaining, will take a wound. Now, if a hero only has one wound, uh, one health la left, they will be disrupted to the infirmary as well. Other results that you can get on the battle die include a push result. So after the kill results have been applied and then disrupt results, units can be pushed. And so the attacker will decide where the, push, uh, where the defense defending unit will be pushed into, what area, if it can be legally done. So if uh, an area that is adjacent is at capacity, the unit would have to take a disruption instead. And then shield results, when rolled by the defensive player, will block, kill, disrupt, and push results. By the way, a unit with two or more health 
can ignore a push result and instead take a wound instead of being pushed out of the area. Now let's look at an example. You may remember that I activated this area. I had the hero move here and I said that my bowman with the arching range attack was going to fire over this area into this area and that my sergeant of arms were going to do a melee attack into this area. So let's do the bowman attack first. The bowman uh, rolled two yellow battle dice in a range attack and they have uh, shields turned into disruption results. So because I have one bowman unit there, I will roll two dice. The cavalry unit, when we look at their defense, they only have one black die on defense. But black dice roll a lot of shields. So it's actually not bad for them. So here we go. I roll. Okay, so a shield becomes a disruption. They did not roll a shield to block anything. So results are applied in order. So if a red die was rolled, for instance, the kill result would be applied first and they would be removed. However, bowmen do not get red dice and so the disruption occurs. If the cavalry unit had rolled a shield, they could have blocked the disruption. Let's say they did. They blocked the disruption, but they get pushed instead. So as the attacker, I could push him into here and, and hope, to, hope to harm them with my sergeant of arms, or I can push him over here. But let's say they didn't block anything, the disruption would occur first, and they'd be placed into the infirmary. Now let's do the sergeant of arms attack. The sergeant of arms, oops, wrong one. The sergeant of arms rolls a red die. I have two sergeant of arms. So they each get one red die each. The cavalry each get one black die each. So remember, this is simultaneous. Okay, I rolled a kill and a push. The cavalry roll. They got a shield blocking the kill result and the disruption doesn't block anything. So I could have killed one, but they blocked it. Instead, I get to push one unit. So I'll push one over here because I made a side now, since I have another uh, activation cube, to activate this area, and I could have all three bowmen attack into here, and even have my hero do a melee attack. And all those would happen at the same time. So I'd roll six yellow dice, and for my hero, if I hadn't upgraded him, would roll one red die. Now if I did upgrade him, Say I upgraded him to this side, he'd roll a white and a yellow die, and when attacking, I can change one white or one yellow to a disruption. So that's one of the advantages of upgrading your heroes. You can get better attacks. As mentioned before, you typically can only activate an area once during your current player turn. So in order for the English player to activate this area again, the English player would have to have a reactivation cube. So let's say the English player activates this area and wants to attack again with the same units or could attack with one of the units and move the other units. You don't have to do the same exact thing. Now before that even occurs, I could say, all right, I'm done. And then the French player can say, well, I'm going to interrupt and attack with my cavalry and then place an interrupt cube here and they can do an attack and I would roll defensive dice and then it would be back to my next activation and that's where I can reactivate here. And remember I could use this cube, it's just a regular activation cube if I want as a, uh, remember brown, blue, and green can be regular uh, uh, gray activation cubes if you want them to be. Terrain can also have an impact on movement and combat. For example, these bowmen in the hills will get plus one uh, area range. So normally they can shoot only two areas away, but the hill will extend it to three areas. They will also get the retaliation skill, which I'll explain here in a little bit. Uh, cavalry who charge across the, the plains 
will get a reroll when they attack. So if they do a charge here, you'd have to place a green activation cube into there. And remember, when you charge, you can also attack the same turn that you charge. So they would roll into here. And they normally get two red dice on their attack. And like the reroll token, which you could use once and then it's removed, they automatically get a reroll if they decide to use it. So there's two cavalrymen. And they'll roll the four dice. And let's say they don't like the shield result. In fact, they want to try to get more uh, kill results and disruption results. So they reroll that. And look, they got two kill and two disruptions. And so the bowmen would roll, they roll white dice on defense. There's three bowmen there. And the hero has a black die. And so now they roll. And they're able to block the two kill results at least. And these don't do anything. But two units are disrupted. And you, the defender can decide where to apply them. So he'll remove the two archers to the infirmary here. Other terrain effects, you would have to look on the chart here. And it's on the cheat sheet that you see here as well. As mentioned, terrain can also affect movement. Something that I haven't talked about is the follow-up after combat option. This means that if the cavalry unit had removed all these units out of this area, either through kill results or disruption, they, hop, they have the option of moving in right away. Now, the bowmen could have placed stakes into this area, which would prevent them from moving in. But next turn, since there's no units in this area, they can move in to the area uh, removing the stakes. Another important skill that some units have is a retaliation skill. But this skill can also be acquired uh, depending on what terrain you're in. So for instance, the Sergeant of Arms has a retaliation skill. But you could also get it by being in the hills. So let's say the French player activates these cavalry units. These cavalry units are going to attack these two Sergeant of Arms and this cavalry unit is going to attack these bowmen on the hill. Now, the Sergeant of Arms automatically gets the retaliation skill, and the bowmen get it for being in the hills. So we roll for the cavalry. They each get two red dice, two separate attacks here. The Sergeant of Arms gets one red die as defense. So let's do this first. So the cavalry roll. They get two disruption. Now the sergeant of arms gets to roll, and because they have retaliation, they also cause two disruption. So the sergeant of arms will be disrupted into the infirmary, but so will this cavalry unit. Now let's say the cavalry unit rolled to uh, roll the shield and one disruption. Well, when it comes to retaliation the attacker shields do not prevent the retaliation dice. So that's something important to remember, that the attacker rolls the dice, ignores the shields even on a retaliation roll. Now units can also take a bonus action, which is recruiting a civilian. So in the introductory scenario, the citizen can be recruited, and all that it needs to do is that a unit moves into the space and then recruits the civilian. So this card would be added to the English player's uh, card inventory. More likely in the first scenario, the French player will recruit the guide. And you just follow uh, the actions, the benefits that the citizen will grant the side that recruits them. And some of them actually have defense.
Recruited civilians can also be destroyed in an attack action. Uh, keep in mind that if an allied unit with a recruited unit is no longer in the area with this uh, recruited civilian, that recruited civilian will become unrecruited. In addition, if for some reason uh, the English player here did not recruit that civilian and in, the, uh, in an attack a disruption result is uh, not applied to the arch unit, it would be applied to the civilian and the civilian would be removed from the game. As is indicated here in the exclamation uh, paragraph. Another important bonus action is one that can only be performed by characters with the command bonus action. So you'll see here, for instance, that the generic English hero has the command action here that shows that they can apply it to an adjacent area and to one unit. So this is how it works. Let's say the English player activates this area. They fire their bowmen. The hero can now apply its command action before it takes its action or after. Let's say the hero moves here and does a melee attack here. Now they can apply their command action to this adjacent area or to this adjacent area even if the bowmen are already activated. And notice though, it can only be one unit. So you're not activating the whole area. So some heroes have powerful effects where they can uh, command an area more than two areas away, I'm sorry, more than one area away, uh, or multiple, and or multiple units in that area. So let's say the hero does move here, does its melee attack, and then commands this mounted bowman to activate. It could move or it could attack. Another bonus action that a character can take is the upgrade action. So you may remember that during the council phase, the English player took three experience tokens just so that he or she could upgrade the hero uh, character with three experience tokens. So you pay the three experience. Now again, you would want to do this before the character activates so you can get the benefits. Now, when you have an upgrade card with that's double-sided, you're going to have to choose what side. And for instance, this has different command benefits than this side. This has different attack and uh, skill options than this side. For instance, because this is the unholy faction, they get the terror skill. Whereas this is the holy side and they get the prayer skill. So uh, you can't upgrade a character in an area where there's other troops or characters of a different faction. So something that either player can do at any time during their turn is to play a legend card. Now you'll see here that there are two different types of legend cards. There's a myth that are used, typically used in fantasy scenarios and tactics that are used in historical scenarios. In the introductory scenario, it's only going to be tactics card. So you may remember that the French player took a, an additional tactics card and has two legend tokens that can be used to pay for this card which costs two or to pay for this one which costs one. Now you may also notice on the phase uh, turn order that each player has a reserve phase. So all this means is that any unused orders go down here into the reserve area of their player boards at the end of their turn and you can only have up to three uh, in reserved, which can be used for the following round. After each player has taken their turn, we move into the fourth step of the current round, the camp phase. And the first part of the camp phase is the casualty check. Now you may remember that we had two units in the infirmary. And so each unit rolls the doom die. If a flag is rolled, the unit immediately rallies to the rally point on the board. And here it is here for the English player. Now the unit will rally into this area if there is space. So you may remember that half uh, hexes with halves, you can have up to six units or six spaces in that half. 
So there's plenty of space here for the Bowman. However, if there wasn't space, the unit would go, would be in the waiting area and wait for the next turn to try to rally. In addition, if those sergeant of arms weren't there and instead was occupied by an enemy unit, the bowman also could not rally. So that means that the bowman would be in the waiting area and would try again in the next uh, casualty check in the following round. If a skull is rolled, the unit is just destroyed and the opposing player would collect any benefits. If a disruption is rolled, the unit stays there and will roll again the following casualty check. And then that's, uh, oh, and if waiting is rolled, they will wait here and try to rally next turn, hoping that the rally point is open. Here again is a review of the Doom Dice results. An important thing to remember that if death results during the casualty check, the unit is considered destroyed, and for that uh, opposing side, they can get experience points. So there will be different experience uh, rewards depending on the scenario. So for the introductory scenario, for each enemy infantry that unit that is destroyed, it will be worth one experience, cavalry units will be worth two, and each character is worth four experience. Also during the camp phase, both players will check to see if the victory conditions were met. Uh, in the introductory scenario, if Bertrand is destroyed, the English win. They also win if four civilians are destroyed by starvation. The uh, introductory scenario goes over how that works. But you could also have the end game if neither result is uh, achieved by the fifth round. And that means that the French don't get Bertrand into a village area before they all starve. I just talked about the most important rules to play the introductory scenario. There are additional rules that are used in other scenarios that I will briefly mention. For example, you can acquire intrigue tokens by talking to civilians. And these tokens can be spent to get special benefits. Now there is an errata in the rule book. Uh, you will receive one intrigue token when you have a discussion with a civilian no matter what. And then you can acquire additional intrigue tokens depending on how the discussion goes. You can also acquire equipment cards. Uh, other rules include uh, larger buildings, walls, uh, rocks and bushes, damage tokens where you can damage buildings, setting fires, barricades that block movement, gigantic creatures which uh, get a special gigantic die uh, with uh, special results that can force uh, the whole area, for instance, to leave when, depending on what you roll. Uh, you have flying units and war machines. I want to thank you for watching this How to Play video, Time of Legends Joan of Arc, a game I'm very pleased to own. However, there is a learning curve when it comes to applying the skills and terrain effects and abilities of units in combat. And you'll see in the second part uh, in the playthrough video with Julie how we deal with those rules. So I hope you take the time to watch the playthrough and thank you for watching this how to play video.